when some other folks found out what he was doing um, that were higher up the Toyota food chain, they said, oh, you got to go onto the line. And he was like, yeah. He's like, we're not allowed. We have to ask permission. In a world filled with uncertainty, two semi-intelligent, somewhat interesting, Midwestern, family guy, business coaches with dad bods, ooh, provide mildly insightful ideas through their semi-focused dialogue. Welcome to It Doesn't Take a Genius. Ramsey! Marshall, I'm, I'm hoping that my audio sounds a little stronger today. I, uh, I realized in our last episode that I recorded it uh, with the microphone set to picking up omnidirectional. Ooh. And uh, I think it was getting an echo. Now I've got it set up cardioid, as the cool guys call it, where it's sort of heart shaped and, uh, uh, you know, pointed at me. So I I'm never... hoping that our listeners, both of them, really appreciate it. I, it wasn't until this this moment that I that I connected the cardioid setting of my microphone to the heart shape. <laughs> I am so, I am so sad. Uh, yeah, yeah. I thought here I thought it was this very sophisticated, specific audio file <laughs> you know, terminology, and it's like, no, shape like <laughs> Valentine. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Like, That's like, pretty much it. See, I was thinking it was way better than that. Uh, you know, once once again. Missed it, yeah. You know, missed it by a mile. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad we were able to, you know, kind of help you. I, I I did take some broadcasting courses, and and I'd like to think I helped you sort of go to the source, if you will, go to go to where it happens and find yeah. some things out. I know. I now understand where the source of that word came from. <laughs> and so uh, yes, I, I'm very excited, which leads us to our topic today. And yes. uh, uh, our topic is uh, Genji Gimbutsu. And this is the part where you go, Gazuntite. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like he had a little Genji Gimbutsu on his sleeve. <laughs> I, I enjoyed that for breakfast. It was delicious. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. Yeah, I gave up the Muselex, went with the Genji Gimbutsu uh, <laughs> as my fi main fiber source. <laughs> so, oh, so, yeah, this but is. Uh, I got exposed to this uh, uh, working uh, you know, with a with a small auto group. We've got a couple auto groups now that have Toyota stores. Yes, and uh, as part of the Toyota way, uh, the, you know, there's 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 four elements. The two that 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 well, the one that most people are familiar with is the concept of kaizen. Yeah, and the there is no such thing as the best. It can always be better. Right. The, the idea of continual improvement. So, you know, we've talked about always improving, always improving, always looking for just that 1% more. Uh, yeah. And, and we've talked about that. And so, but uh, I was, I think a lot of people are, you know, it's kind of made it into mainstream society now and it, it's yeah. a fairly mainstream idea, but Genji Gambutsu, uh, I think is a simpler idea that mm -hmm. just hasn't gotten the, the mainstream acceptance. So with this breakthrough video, we're going to put it on the map. We're going to let people know <laughs> what it is and why it's important to you, uh, whether it's life or work, uh, it, it, it could make a difference. So the, uh, the term loosely translates in Japanese to uh, either go to the source or simply, some people translate it to go see, go yeah. and see, go and see. Yeah. Yeah. So go to the source. Uh, you know, I was talking to the stores who've, who've had it in their, in their stores for a while. And then there was, there was three different examples of, uh, of, of how this came into play. And, and so the go see piece of it, um, basically they started using it in terms of not jumping to conclusions. Mm -hmm. So, so I had a the group yesterday and we were working and I, and I asked them, I said, you know, just, you know, I had about 30 managers. I said, how many times have you acted upon secondhand information only to find out later that you didn't have all the facts? That's right. And you know, a hundred percent. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just did it about five minutes before I came into the room. <laughs> you know, just, uh, you know, it's such a common thing. We get a little bit of information. Uh, we, we, we take that as the gospel. 
and then we, we we make a decision, we make a process change, we 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 have a conversation, and only afterwards do we go, oh, yeah, wait yeah, a I minute. Did, yeah, I didn't know everything that I needed to know uh, about this situation, about this process. Right. That that this was a this was a one off thing, right? We changed our whole process based upon this one outlier that may or may never happen again. Yeah. And, and if it does, it, it wouldn't be as dramatic as, as keeping our existing process. So, so, you know, that rings true with a lot of people and you've heard managers talk about, you know, some of the different ways they, they, they force themselves to combat this. Uh, any, any, uh, any examples come to mind? Uh, about a million. Um, I, I think this has followed us our entire career, Mike, uh, since you and I have known each other um, because frankly, the continuous improvement movement, uh, which, you know, came from, uh, Dr. Deming going over after World War II to Japan to help them rebuild their economy, and he was helping them look at statistics and and looking for quality measurements that they could measure uh, and constantly improve. That's where this all comes from. And, and please note that Mr. Deming tried to share his idea in America. One hundred percent. They weren't they, having they, it. Then he took it to Japan. That, that's exactly right. They sort of listened to him during the war, and then they were like, "Yeah, I think we'll go back to our old ways now." But but the Japanese were hungry and um and and really good listeners, frankly. And so um so so a, a couple stories. One is um, I had a, a client um, that the the parts. Uh, well, let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to. To try to make this as brief as possible. We had two departments that were not talking to each other. I mean, literally, the managers refused to be in the same room together by the time I got to the store. Nice. They were so mad at each other for setting up a, uh, it was basically a loyalty card for this company, for their customers. Uh, they were setting it up different ways. And it was penalizing the other department, right? It was coming out of their budget based on what they were doing. Long story short, I went to the source, right? I went back and forth between the two of them uh, all day long. It was like shuttle diplomacy. And I finally got them convinced that neither of them were actually seeing what the other person was seeing. Like that one of them had to be wrong about how this whole thing started or, or you know, there, there, there was something something desperately wrong here because reality did not match up with what they were saying happened. And I'm, I'm sort of, you know, ping in broad brush strokes so I don't betray any confidences here. But the long and the short of it is I got him in the same room. We started talking. And then we found out that we still had not gone to where it happens. We still were not talking to the source because nobody had actually asked the accountant. So they went to the office and talked to the manager of the, of the business department. And the business department manager said, um, oh, yeah, I've been doing it this way. Why Why have you been doing it this way? Well, you guys never told me anything. I just assumed this was what I was supposed to do. So from the get-go, these two people who were literally unable to speak to each other had never brought the the, the back end of the organization into the conversation. And so they were, I mean, they, they were literally, uh, they were literally unable to speak to each other because of this. If they had just gone to the source, you know, why why did this happen this way? We talk about the five whys. You know, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's another one of the Japanese concepts, Toyota concepts, that let's keep asking why until we get to the source, to the root. And so so this is, uh, I mean, I could go on and on about examples of where uh, people have shot first, asked questions later. And if they had just asked the questions first, if they had gone humbly to wherever it was that this problem happened to investigate, learn a little bit more, be a reporter, be a detective, it would have saved them so much trouble in the long run. Oh, Oh yeah, yeah. It, 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 you know, when you think about the, the, you know, just in that in that specific case, how much lost productivity, how much lost oh time, yeah, yeah, was spent on this, this literally this non-issue. Uh, My client paid me for a day of work, and that is the one thing I accomplished because I had to keep going, having separate conversations back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We could have solved that before I got to the store by them just talking to the accountant. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw one the other day. You know, customer comes in, talks to the general manager. Uh, this particular dealership customer's upset. Nobody's helping me. The car's been sitting for days. Nobody's communicating. Right? And the GM's, GM's like, "I'll, oh, I'll oh, get to the bottom of this." So he goes, bypasses service manager, goes straight to the technician who's working on the car. Technician's like, 
what are you talking about? I've, you know, here's what I've been working on this thing almost nonstop, you know, and, 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 and then, and then he's like, I don't, I don't know what the service manager is talking about. So, so, you know, finally the, after the GM, you know, apologized to the technician for getting on his case, right. He goes to the service manager and service manager lays out, you know, they basically had been, you know, it was just, just coddling this customer. They'd already goodwilled over a thousand dollars worth of repairs. It just, oh, you know, geez. You know he, this guy's like, we gave him a loaner car. We gave, you know, this is all we've done for this guy. And the GM's like, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, just, yeah, just, you know, he was going to go in there, and, you know, and, and I think that's one of the keys to this, right? He had great intentions. Oh, sure. I'm, I'm going to be yeah. this customer's advocate. I'm going to, you know, take care of the customer's job one. And I'm, I'm, yep. I've got the power to make great things happen and I'm on it and miss the whole thing. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's one of, one of the big uh, applications here of, of this particular episode is, would you, you know, we, we've talked about this before from a coaching perspective, just ask one more question, just stay curious, just a little bit longer. And in this case, it, it might be with, you know, a big, uh, a, a big problem that uh, brews internally and, and is affecting operations and efficiency and so on. Or it might be that customer situation where a customer throws a hand grenade and uh, frustrates you. But either way, you know, hmm, I wonder what else I need to know. Mm -hmm. I wonder what else I need to know. Well, here's some questions. Uh, all right. So before you jump to a conclusion... Ask yourself, right? The simplest of questions: uh, Do I have all the information? Mm -hmm. uh, right? Do I have all the information? Uh, you know, I've got I've got GMs. As soon as if a customer calls them direct, uh, the first thing they do is they they start bringing up the ROs or the D, you know whatever the, the the information that they can have, right? Right? So they can arm themselves so that they can you know before they get even anybody else involved. Yep. The uh, ask yourself: Is there more here than meets the eye? So this is what's presented, mm -hmm. right, right, what's under the surface. Mm -hmm. My favorite one of this that I think we we miss is, is this out of character for this person? Mm -hmm. right? The story you're telling me, just, you yeah. know, and, and, you've, and we've said the words like, oh, that just doesn't sound like them. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you're like, okay, you know, uh, yep. had a wonderful example of this, uh, my daughter came home one day. She was real tiny, and 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 we kind of you know had one of these Mayberry esque backyards where all the kids played at each other's houses, and and all the parents were pretty much on the same page parenting wise. And the daughter came home, and she goes, she goes, you need to go yell at Toby, the, the dad across the way. And I'm like, I yes, why I absolutely why why do I need to yell at Toby? Because Toby yelled at me. I'm like, wow. That's terrible. So before I go yell at Toby, <laughs> what what were you doing before he yelled at you? Well, um, you know the bridge over the 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 concrete culvert. I'm like, yeah. She goes, well, I was standing on top of the railing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, huh? And then Toby yelled at you. Huh. Weird. Yeah, that's odd. I said, you're right. We're going to go over and talk to Toby immediately. And you're going to say, thank you. <laughs> this, this isn't how I thought this would go at all. <laughs> this is, you're, you're not listening to me, right? This is, you know, but had I, you know, it would have been very easy as a parent, you, you know, to go right. all, all, you know, postal is like, you're like, Nobody yells at my child, <laughs> you no. know, you know, that's my child. Nobody has the right to yell at my child and just go off. And, but, but it just like, I kept thinking, he's just not, that's not what he does. I, I, it's out of character for him. So there right. must be more going on here. Right. So I'll throw in a couple more questions if you don't mind. Uh, sure. One is uh, what do you mean by fill in the blank? You know, what, whatever is the thing that's been brought up as a problem. Um, I actually learned this from uh, a, a professor, uh, and and it was it was to be used for philosophical debates. You know, let's define our terms before we move forward and and are all frustrated and you know upset at each other. What do we even mean by that thing that we think we're arguing about? So um, so this this comes up all the time, and I've got a, a daughter story. I probably have told it here before, but 
um, you know, she, she came out and said, I can't sleep. And I was impatient and wanted to watch a TV show with my wife. And I said, well, think about what you want to buy your siblings for Christmas and think about that. And I'll help you go back to sleep. I just gave her a pat answer and sent her off to bed, you know, and like maybe 20, 30 minutes later, she comes back out. And finally, like my, my dad gene kicked in. I was like, oh, wait a minute. She's something's wrong. And so I said, uh, what, what do you mean you can't sleep? And she told me about this. I, I, we may have talked about it on the podcast, but there's this Apple watch commercial that they sense have discontinued and it's terrifying. Uh, it's, it's basically the Apple watch calling 911 saying, you know, Bob's in the woods. He's at this location. He's had a fall. He's not responding. Please send emergency vehicles. You know, it's awful. And it's just a pan over a, you know, a, a creepy forest environment. Um, and uh, anyway, there was more to that story, but like, oh, that's the issue. We've got to, we've got to tackle, you know, that concern that she had. It's, it's not, I'm restless or, you know, I, I want to be out of bed or whatever it is. That was the issue. I had to ask more questions to get to, you know, what's really going on here? What's at the source? What's, what's the real motivation here? Oh yeah. Yeah. The best part of your story is when your first remedy was go think about commercial materialism. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, that, that is a, that is a sad like, dad move right there. I, I'm a fairly shallow person. It always worked for me. That, I don't yeah. know why it wouldn't work for her. I'll you know? think of things that we should be buying. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a, yeah. I, yeah. That's your go-to. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah well, like, yeah. like I say, not my proudest moment, but you no, know, no, uh, great, great, great recovery. <laughs> yeah. You recovered, right. recovered nicely. Uh, but yeah, are we in agreement on the definitions? You know, right. so and so is being disrespectful to me. So and so is ignoring me. So and so, you're right. Yeah. Right. What do you mean by being disrespectful? What do you mean by you know? All of a sudden, so, you're, you're you're coming to a you know, maybe it's not what you pictured in your head is what they're talking about. And and that leads to the follow up, which is how did you arrive at that conclusion? In mm -hmm. other words. Tell me the data, the observations you're making, the things that are making you think that this is what's happening. It's it's incredibly useful in interpersonal reactions where you're you're fighting with each other, but it's also you know useful for you know a, a factory wide issue where you know we we think we've got this problem. What's leading us to believe that's a problem? Maybe we ought to go measure it. Let's go to the source and find out what what really is happening. Oh yeah, De definitely. Yeah, yeah. We yeah, you know, and we've got managers who. Uh, who, you know, they've got a standing rule. If you come into their office complaining about another person, then yep. the rule is I pick up the, that manager picks up the phone, gets the other person in the room and we all talk about it together. Yep. That's, that's it. Right. Right. And so yep. uh, I've got other managers. They do. Uh, I'll listen to their side, listen to the other side, then both people in the room at the same time. Yep. Right. Yep. We'll, we'll, we'll talk it out. So, but, so either way, they're going to see, they're going to the source. They're, they're, they're trying to get firsthand information. Yeah. The the next piece of this, they talk about uh, Genji Genbutsu uh, allows you to learn from each other. And they also believe that it leads to connections. Yep. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I, I thought about an example of that. Um, I had a number of GMs do this. Uh, the most recent one where the general manager of the dealership decided that he was going to go work in the the quick lube uh, quick lane the, the the fast oil change drive uh with his team members uh, and so he mm -hmm. comes in you know and they always declare they're going to do it till lunch none of them ever make it <laughs> they, they <don't laughs> right. <laughs> right so they you know you know the boss puts on his jeans and then he gets a you know a technician shirt and he goes out there and he's helping change oil and inspect the cars and rotate tires and 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 do this stuff and i thought about right so so i'll, I'll throw it over to you you know we didn't prep this or anything but but what right. do you think are some of the things that the gm discovers in the the two hours that he's working with that that specifics that that that, that team oh uh, i suspect that uh they're pulled in a number of different directions uh cars pile up they're they're given too many assignments at the same time uh and there, there might be a parts opportunity as well, uh, creeping mm -hmm. into that conversation. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's, there's process issues that are discovered. You, you know, these guys have been doing it. They don't feel like they have the power to change it. So they haven't brought up any of the, you know, so 
within 15 minutes, the, the manager's like, why are we walking all the way over there? Why, why don't you have this tool? What, how come those guys aren't getting back to you? What's, mm -hmm. why is there a line here? It, you know, all of a sudden, uh, right. By going to the source and to go see it, you start to, to, you know, and I've had like changes made instantly. Like, yeah. like in the moment where we where we've changed processes and made their lives a thousand times better, the connection piece. All right, this leads to connection. One of the the things that happens is a, the loop tech guys get a huge kick out of watching the GM do his job, do their job poorly. Yeah, <laughs> suffer. Right, right. It's like this guy's terrible. Yeah, and he's so slow, and he. He doesn't know what a torque wrench is, you know, yep. and so there's this this camaraderie, this connection that's fostered. They yep. appreciate the heck that he came down to walk a mile in their shoes, right? Yep. Experience your you know life from your perspective, literally, and, and they respect, they admire that, and then they get a big kick out of being able to do something better than the boss. Yep. So uh, you know that uh, Genji Kambutsu is not a foreign concept to me growing up because my father worked in manufacturing. And so we we talked, you know, with with hallowed respect about the Kaizen process in Toyota. Uh, and I'm and I'm sort of not exaggerating. Dad got excited about this stuff. And I live near the Georgetown, Kentucky plant where it's the biggest Toyota plant in the world. Uh, it, it has its own interstate exit. Um, they've you know, over the last few years they built Avalon's Camry Sienna's uh Lexus's I think the the new electric vehicle is going to be there um and I, I had a chance to work there for a couple of days and I have family and friends that have worked there over the years two two stories that really point to how this uh this this connection piece really happens at Toyota where they where they baked this idea up uh, one is uh, when they had the problems with quality uh, in the, what, mid-2000s, mm -hmm. and there was the brake issue, um, you, you know, they quickly recovered. And I asked uh, a good old boy who worked there from eastern Kentucky, I said, so what changed? And he said, well, things got worse when the white man took over. It was like when we abandoned, when we abandoned the Japanese uh, way, you know, the the way that they approached us things changed because the, the the Americans weren't as plugged into what was going on down here. They didn't understand. They were just throwing numbers at us and, you know, making us hit targets. And and suddenly our hallowed quality standards went away. And so, you know, I, I wondered about that, you know, like how, how baked in were those quality standards and, and that respect that they had for the people that were working the line? I talked to another gentleman who was an engineer. And he asked uh, that he was in a completely different industry, uh, but but working in manufacturing. And he asked if he could take a tour. Um, and, I, and I don't remember all the details of how this bubbled up, but basically he he got access to the floor and got to go down onto the floor and uh, be led around by some of the team leaders. And they showed him some things that gave him some ideas about continuous improvement in his neck of the woods. Well, when some other folks found out what he was doing, um, that were higher up the Toyota food chain, they said, oh, you got to go onto the line. And he was like, yeah. He's like, we're not allowed. We have to ask permission. Wow. So I want you to think about, you know, that that level of um, we, we so value what you people are doing that we're not going to mess with it. And if we come down, we're going to come down in respect and say, can we come down here and observe what's going on? You know, it's the exact opposite of what happens in a lot of dealerships that we've been talking about, where the general manager gets fired up and, you know, runs off, uh, you know, hot to the touch uh, to a department to solve a problem. Let's go find out what's going on. We we trust you all. We respect you. It's treating people with dignity at all levels of the organization. And that's the connection point to me. That's that's that was Toyota's genius was we're going to treat everybody here like they really do count. Mm hmm. Well, and, and by demonstrating, by going to the source and asking for their feedback, their perspective, you're saying that I value that, right? 100%. I value your perspective. I value your, your, your feedback. And, and that's, that's amazing. So the, the last piece of this is the, the, the Japanese believe by going to the source, you can get inspired. 
Mm. And I thought about that. And I was like, well, it's an example of that. And I thought about uh, my first car was a 1967 Mustang, probably mm-hmm. the most beautiful year of that car, right? In 68, they got side marker lights and changed some stuff. But but that 67, you know, and that, that whole first generation up until about 72 from 64 and a half to 72 was just, just iconic, right? They sold a million cars the first year. It was just, it was this huge hit. The second generation Mustang was the Mustang two. Yes. A whew, the one of the ugliest. Yeah. Yeah. A slightly modified Pinto uh, with <laughs> some different fenders and, and uh, uh, yeah, just widely panned by the uh, Mustang enthusiast. They tried to recover with gen three. Uh, yeah. They came out with the Fox body, Fox body, uh-huh. the stealth, right? Let's just yep. put a bunch of right angles and, you know, straight panels on it, which, which the early Mustangs were just almost Ferrari like in their curvature, right? We, we abandoned all that. Uh, then the fourth generation, they went with, Hey, everything's looking like the Taurus, the bubble Taurus, right? Like, so they get made yep. everything look like a raindrop. Yep. So you get this bubble Mustang that, that was just, oh, it was just horrible. And so, you know, but they still sold enough that they wanted to have the fifth generation. And so the chief designer was assigned for the fifth generation Mustang. And he said, well, let's go to the source. And he did something that he wanted to inspire his, his team of designers. He said, before we make a single line on a piece of paper, here's what we're going to do. And he went out and he got uh, the early, the first generation Mustangs, he got a 65, a, a 65, a 67, 69, and he brought them to the parking lot and he made all the designers go outside and wash them by hand. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, right. So he wanted them to, you know, because anytime you wash your car, right, there's there's ridges and bumps and, and, and design cues that aren't readily available to the eye, depending on your perspective, but it's a key part of the design DNA. And yeah. he wanted them to feel every panel, right? Feel the lights, feel the curvature mm-hmm. of the wheel wells, the whole thing. And then they designed the uh, fifth generation Mustang, the 2005, which was a massive hit because it, Huge hit. Yeah, it, it just harkened back to all the design cues, all the things that made the first generation great. And I, I thought, you know, the, the idea was inspired to think about, all right, how do we get back to what made this originally amazing? Right. And, and how do I do it in such a way that's participative, interactive, and, and, and that there's tremendous, very quick learning about, about this vehicle and the idea of hand washing these, these original cars uh, to inspire the designers, just one of my favorite automotive stories of all time. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, and I hate the fourth generation Mustang so much. And so I, I really appreciate you highlighting that. Um, you know, the, but that's happened so often, right? That um, somebody says, okay, wait a minute. What, what is really the essence of what makes us awesome? You know, we, we had glory days. What was the essence of that glory? Um, I'm thinking of Harley Davidson, right? Like they, mm-hmm. um, when they went through their Renaissance in the what late nineties, early two thousands, it was, it was the, uh, I can't remember if it was the president or the CEO or both, but he had a, a notebook, you know, just a little, little flip, you know, notepad of paper that he carried with him at all times. And anywhere he was out and saw somebody with a Harley, you know, he would go and, and talk to them, you know, what do you love about this? What, what makes a Harley a Harley? And, and he got all these notes that he brought back to really, you know, it was a true renaissance for the entire organization. Um, and, and a number of companies, you know, have to do this when they're reinventing themselves. When they're at the best, they're they're not reinventing themselves. They're going back to the essence of what made their their product or service great in the first place. Um, but you don't you don't just do that in a vacuum. You do that by by going back. I mean, you you have to go to the place. You have to go where it happened. So uh, I, I love that. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. The the idea of yeah, I can be inspired by recalling what what originally inspired me what what was the original yeah. you know nugget i love your word essence uh, that that made this great yeah. um so the genji genbutsu way right directly observe uh, it should become a way of business yeah. right just this is what we do is when we have an issue we go to the source 
uh, going to the source for inspiration and then uh, building relationships and creating connections in the process of those interactions. Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's, that's awesome. Um, one last story, uh, and, and I hope it gives folks some insights into how they can do an employee team. But I once had an employee team where they were trying to figure out, you know, our parts department is really growing. Um, what, what do we need to do? You know, what, what could we do to, uh, you know, sort of enhance our, maybe our layout of our building or, you know, something that would change our processes so that it was a little easier to get the parts because it just seems like it's getting harder to, to, you know, we just have so many parts and, uh, the parts manager, um, was interviewed by the team and, um, he said, well, I mean, yeah, it's pretty bad. You know, we have all these trailers and we're just, we're kind of having to make it up as we go along because so many parts are coming in. And they were like, what do you mean? I said, well, let's go find out. Would you mind if we take a tour? And he had, I think at the time we were up to 13, like tractor trailer size trailers. Oh my gosh. And during a rainstorm, we took a tour of all 13, you know, opened it up. Could you fit more? No, nothing more could go in here. Nothing more could go in here. Anyway, long story short, that team was not the sole reason, but it was one of the points where, you know, the, the owner got the a message that was, we, there is no way that we have so much. And they ended up buying an entire property uh, that became a parts warehouse. As soon as they bought it, they essentially filled it up and were ready to expand. I mean, that that's how much business was there. And, and I don't even want to tell you the dollar amount of revenue that they bring in monthly now. It's just, it's just awesome, just amazing. But none of that would have happened if they hadn't literally stood up and walked out of the room. And instead of having a, a meeting in the boardroom, they went out and, and got to see what was going on actually in the, the environment. So they, they literally did Genji Gambutsu in the moment. And uh, the rest was financial history for that organization. You can get inspired in all sorts of ways. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just get up and go see. Just go. <laughs> yeah, just let's go. Let's, let's go look at it. <laughs> you know, just and, and be that, that wildly curious manager who, who just wants to see it and, and, and discover firsthand, right? Let, let's, let's see what's going on and, and, and build connections, get inspired and, and directly observe what's going on. I, I want to say one more thing. If you are not the kind of manager who is wired to be that empathetic uh, person who's really people oriented, you will be shocked if you do this the right way, how incredibly respectful and humble you come across. And I don't mean humble it like like a meek person who has no power. I mean the kind of person who respects those that he works with. You will get so much extra goodwill out of this. It's just going to blow your mind. Mm -hmm. um, because it is respectful. It is an incredibly respectful way to treat other people to say, let me go see what's going on from your perspective. So this is just, it, it's it's powerful for a number of different reasons. And I think it's why Toyota won the ball game in the 90s. So I, I, I'm i glad we're doing an episode about this. Oh, oh, definitely. Yeah, and people are, people are excited. It's been my experience. People are excited to show you what the, how they've made it work, right? Here's, the, here's how we make this thing work. And they're also excited to tell somebody about the parts that are frustrating them. Oh, right? you know and, it. and to show them, right? This thing here, right? This window here, we can't pass this to, you know, this is not working. And oh, yep. oh yeah, I see that. Yeah, right. So yep. so so yeah, either way, they seem to be excited to share the the wins and the opportunities that they're experiencing. Nailed it. Nailed it. Excellent, excellent. Well, speaking of going to the source, the source for all narrator wisdom, uh, we'll turn it over True. to our our man. Uh, Mr. John Wolf. Take it away, Mr. Wolf. And that's a wrap. The musings of Mark and Mike. No rights reserved, etc. Feel free to share and discuss what you heard today. Even claim the ideas as your own. <laughs> Who'd want to do that? See you next time on It Doesn't Take a Genius. Thanks. That's good enough. <laughs>